Where's Nasty Nork? The way Spyro flies into the title screen of his debut adventure has left a permanent image embedded in my brain. There's something so nostalgic about it, I almost instantaneously transport back into the body of my younger self, and it feels like I'm getting to experience the PlayStation 1 for the first time all over again. It just screams at you that this game is going to be something special. Although this isn't my favorite Spyro the Dragon title screen in the series, I'll be talking about my favorite one another time. I'm bringing this up because unfortunately the Reignited Trilogy did away with the intro screens which, although small, is a really big bummer to me because I'm missing out on that nostalgic feeling I would always get when revisiting these games. That being said, I'm still going to be using the Reignited Trilogy for this review because overall I find it to be the definitive experience for the trilogy, especially the first game. I will still reference the original in some instances because I think it's important to point out some of the flaws with the Reignited trilogy as well as the things the original might have done better or worse. Any footage from the original Spiral of the Dragon on PS1 is going to be from some really old footage of a let's play I did when I was 13 years old. The quality is pretty awful, but I think it's a great way to show just how long I've been a fan of this series, especially since in that let's play it was the first time I ever 100% completed the game. One last thing before I get started, if I'm talking about the soundtrack in any way, I will only be referring to Stuart Copeland's original soundtrack because it's just the one I prefer. So with introductions out of the way, my name is Legit Camel, and this is a Spyro the Dragon retrospective. So I assume most people watching this video have played Spyro and are here looking for a more in-depth critique, so I'm just going to jump straight into the review and talk about the first hub world of the game and explain to you why I think this is the best hub world in the first Spyro the Dragon. I know it seems pretty bold to come out and say the opening world is the best one. Maybe this is just my nostalgia speaking to me. After all, the first year I had my PS1, I didn't have a memory card so I had to replay this opening area probably a thousand times. But just hear me out. I'm going to start this off by saying, in my opinion, hub worlds should not have enemies. Who can hurt you at least? Or if they do, it shouldn't be in high traffic areas like in front of portals to worlds or on your path between them. I think the best hub worlds are the ones designed as a big playground for you to test out the controls and explore without a care in the world. Since I don't want to compare this game to its sequel since those games had a chance to realize their mistakes and improve on them, I'm going to bring up Mario 64 and Peach's Castle briefly because games in this genre took a lot of inspiration from that game. Think about how memorable Peach's Castle is and look at almost all the other hub worlds in Spyro the Dragon. The only one that is even remotely as fun to me is the opening world. I'll talk about the other hub worlds later as we get to them, but I'm going to list off all the things I really love about this one first. To start, discovering the secret flight level for the first time is one of my favorite gaming memories as a child. I remember just jumping around on the stones for fun and just so happened to solve the puzzle. I know the other hub worlds also have somewhat hidden flight levels as well, but those ones to me didn't seem to be as much of a secret, so it didn't feel as rewarding to discover. Although with the Reignited trilogy it kind of changes because when you jump on the stones, they start glowing making it much more obvious. I understand why they did it, considering how much more cryptic this level was compared to the others, but at the same time, it kind of loses what made discovering it so special. Second, the exploration. The game just throws you into the hub and you're free to go wherever. It instantly shows you a far off place with a ton of gems just begging to be picked up. All it takes is a well executed glide to get over which serves as a great learning experience for the player. I love how when you're running around exploring, the enemies are extremely terrified of you and instead of trying to kill you, they run away and cower. For me, it added a lot of charm to the game and made me feel super powerful when exploring. Also, the fact that every area is kind of separated into very distinct sections this is a lot to help the hub from feeling overwhelming. Lastly, the giant dragon's head looming over the hub world is an addition I'm in love with. I remember when I first saw it as a kid and I was thinking, oh crap, whatever's behind that is probably going to be super scary. What's weird is all the other hub worlds don't have any other neat things separating the boss level from the rest of the levels in the world, so this is truly one of the only defined boss levels in the entire game. It sets a great goal for the player to try and accomplish. 
Obviously, for someone who has played plenty of games, the hub seems pretty small and forgettable, but if you think about a younger audience or players who are new to games, a lot of these aspects are extremely important. Also, most of the things that I think made this hub great get changed or forgotten about in all the other hub worlds. So for all those reasons, I think this is the best hub world and a fantastic introduction area for the player. But the worlds inside this hub make it even better. Stone Hill, which will usually be the first level the player goes into, is the embodiment of what makes Spiral of Dragons so great. The level enters you into a completely open area with branching pathways surrounding you, giving you an overwhelming feeling of exploration. As you run around collecting gems, curiosity gets to you and you decide to take a peek down the well. Lo and behold, it's a little treasure trove with a dragon to rescue, but you're also met with a locked box leading you on a quest to now search for a hidden key. You start to head into the next open area and hear someone laughing at you as you pass through. What could that be? You continue through and at the top of the tower you notice some gems sparkling in the distance, inviting you to take a leap of faith over to collect them. All of a sudden you're at the top of the level, which I'm sure coming into it you never expected. In the back of your head you're thinking this must be where the key is hiding. All of a sudden you're greeted by the egg stealer as you realize he was the source of the laughter in the tunnel. You collect the egg and all the gems, but still no key. You feel like you have searched everywhere, but then you finally look over a ledge and you see a sandy beach with yet another gem grinning at you. The last secret area is you have finally found that key back at the beginning of the level and finished everything to 100%. That to me is the magic of Spiral, the full scale of exploring level and finding new areas you never knew you could get to. I think that is exactly what Insomniac had in mind for Spiral because they invented a way to remove the fog distance that plagued early platforming games by making things far off lose quality to save performance. By doing so, it made the act of climbing high and gliding around at small sparkles in the distance so inherently fun and rewarding. This level probably isn't the best at doing any of these things individually, but it's probably one of the only levels to incorporate the open level design, hidden areas, far off places, and subtle hints all in one jam packed area. One caveat I'm going to bring up is that the Reignited trilogy makes finding secret areas a lot easier by giving you the ability to have sparks point where missing gems are on the map. This isn't inherently a bad thing, but sometimes it can make it a little too easy and ruin what made the moment of finding the beach with the missing key so special. My main complaint with Stone Hill is since the level comes so early on, it is extremely short and the enemies pose no real threat to your progression through the level. But we will see some examples of levels implementing what this level showcases even better later on. Clifftown is a great example of this. It isn't a particularly large level, but it takes the concept from Stone Hill of showing you some far off gems you need to glide over to and ramps it up to 11. Back on the PS1, being able to see that far into the distance was just unheard of, and taking the leap of faith over the river to collect more gems and battle more enemies, unlocking the rest of the level still fills me with exhilaration to this day. Clifftown also has some of the most interesting enemy designs in the game, and I always get a chuckle when I watch the steel caped guys get slapped in the ass forcing them to run at you to their death. On top of some cool hidden areas with extra gems, it's just so much fun gliding around and exploring the town. Dry Canyon, which is located in the same hub world as Clifftown, is also a great example of the game taking what you learn from Stone Hill and expanding upon those fundamentals. Dry Canyon tests your brain with an area that at first is seemingly impossible to glide over to, but with some intuition you eventually get the gratification of finding the proper ledge to glide off of. Along with some tricky far off glides later on, this is another very solid spiral level. I'm going to sidetrack really briefly here to just talk about how disappointed I was with the Reignited Trilogy when they didn't bring back the gems you collected in a level floating down into a chest as you started loading into the next world. It takes away a little bit of the charm I had with the original games. Since I have a moment and we are kind of on the topic of gems, I'm going to also bring up how much I love the collectibles in this game. In my opinion, Spiral the Dragon has the perfect amount of collectibles. Some collectathon platformers have way too many things to look for and collect. For example, Donkey Kong 64. Spyro has just three, but they are all unique and fun to look for. Gems are great because they all have a different number value, which keeps it from feeling stale to collect, and that little noise they make when you grab one is just addictive. I also think the design is genius because of how they can shine off from the distance, luring the player in to go and grab it, which incentivizes exploration. But I've probably ranted about that enough. 
The dragons stuck in stone are a good objective to progress the game, and it's exciting to see what kind of dragon you rescued and listen to the fun dialogue they give. The Reignited Trilogy improved on this greatly by making all the dragons much more unique and adding a lot more dialogue. The Egg Thieves aren't my favorite collectible, I find them pretty annoying to catch a lot of the time, but they are a welcome break from the rest of the game. But moving on to the next level in the Artesian homeworld. Dark Hollow is typically the next level the player will go into, but before I say anything else, the song in this level, best in the entire series. I know this may be controversial considering how great all of Stuart Copeland's work is in the entire series, but I'm not the kind of guy to just randomly put on video game music tracks while chilling out, and I find myself getting the urge to put this song on at least once a week while I'm doing work. It's just that good. I think this is a good time to segue into my overall thoughts on the music in this game. In short, the soundtrack is great, but I can't say it's the best work Copeland has done in this series. I'll try my best to explain why that is, because even though I don't think this is his best work, the original Spy of the Dragon soundtrack does have my favorite songs. The problem is, overall the soundtrack as a whole isn't the best. When playing through the game again, most songs kind of started to just sound the same when jumping from level to level. Every track is kind of dreary and hard, if that makes sense. In comparison, look at the soft melody in Summer Forest from Spyro 2. You can just get lost in the song, and it almost just takes all your worries away. I just don't ever get that feeling in the songs from the original Spyro. If I listen to the songs on their own without playing the game, I actually end up enjoying the songs a lot more, and in that aspect it's probably the best. But when paired with the game's levels, it just starts to wash away. To summarize, in Spyro 2 and 3, Copeland ends up doing a much better job matching the music with the level. When I cover those games, I will go more in detail on how I think he went about doing that. But in the original Spiral of the Dragon, even though on an individual song basis I like listening to these tracks more than the subsequent games, they don't make me feel more engrossed in the level I'm playing like the latter games do. Sorry to detract, but I felt like the soundtrack was something important to discuss. Anyway, the level design in Dark Hollow kinda takes the player on a different learning curve than Stonehill. The thing this level introduces to the player that Stonehill didn't is some different enemy types. We have large enemies who can only be taken down with flame, and shielded enemies who need to be rammed. Realizing you can't just brainlessly flame everything in sight, but some enemies require a specific attack to defeat, adds some much needed progression and difficulty to the game. The most memorable part for me in this level was the branching path off to the side that you can completely choose not to do. I'm not sure why, but as a kid these big armor guys just terrified me. I think it's because they will literally sprint at you going Mach 10, then belly flop you and laugh in your face, which probably scared the piss out of me as a kid. In reality, all you need to do is fling their back, but it's a memory I will always cherish, and I think it's another part of what makes Dark Hollow so great. Misty Bog takes the stepping stones of what Dark Hollow was teaching you and adds on to it. I remember back in the day, people used to complain about the difficulty spike in Misty Bog. Playing through it again for this review, I'm not sure why everyone hated this level so much. But I'm also playing the Reignited Trilogy, and I can't help but think that they made this level a lot easier from the original. I remember the weird rabbit looking mud things being a lot faster jumping towards you, and the frogs also being a lot faster with their tongues lashing out. But who knows, maybe I've just become a pro at it. I bring this level up in tandem with Dark Hollow because although it isn't teaching the player different enemy types, it is teaching the player how to deal with more difficult enemies, even though this level comes much later on in your playthrough. Overall, the level really doesn't bring much to the table outside of being kinda of difficult, so in my opinion, it's kind of a stinker, but it's still important because these concepts culminate into one of my favorite levels in the game. Dark Passage Honestly, this level is a close second place favorite for me, and depending on my mood, I might even say this is my personal favorite level in the game. But when I look at it analytically, I would still have to give it to a different level I'll mention later on. It's amazing that this level managed to slip into one of my least favorite sections of the entire game, which I will also be bringing up later on. My favorite part of this level is honestly just the theme. 
I love how the enemies are either cute in the light or absolutely terrifying in the dark. Not to get too deep about it, but I think it's a great reflection on how a child perceives things in the night. It reminds me of being a kid and feeling like the second the lights went off for bedtime the boogeyman was going to come out and attack me from under the bed. I'm sure other people will perceive the theme in a different way than I did with the contrast between night and day, but that's what makes it such a great concept. The level poses a pretty genuine challenge with the turtles being shielded from flame and if they are in their large form they can't be charged or flamed, along with the dogs who if in their large form can't be charged but can be flamed. We also have ranged enemies as well. It takes all the core enemy concepts from earlier on in the game and sticks it into one level. If you continue to search for gems past the return home portal, you basically unlock an entire second half of the level to explore and collect. Also, on the Reignited trilogy in particular, they made this level look absolutely breathtaking. This had to have been like one of the developers favorite levels for how much extra detail they added to make it look amazing. The only major downside to this level is that it's extremely linear. You don't really have a whole lot of exploration going on, which I kind of knock on other levels for, but I really just enjoy coming back to this level because of its theme and the challenge, and sometimes it's enough to make a fantastic level. I think these three levels combined really build into the final levels of the game. I'm going to somewhat kind of go in order to talk about each hub world, so I'll be talking about how these levels relate to the end game once we get to Nasty Nork. I know I have been a little all over the place when talking about the levels in the game, but I think it's important to show the progression of the core fundamentals that build into the level design, and how it culminates into the best levels in the game, and how it ultimately makes Spiral the Dragon so good. I'm going to talk about the hub worlds in order leading up to the end of the game, but if some of the levels relate to each other, I'll talk about them in a group. I'm going to finish off the Artisan Homeworld by talking about Town Square. It's kind of a good combination of the last two levels combined, although it doesn't really reach the peaks of what the last two levels were trying to showcase with the exploration from Stone Hill and the more difficult enemies from Dark Hollow. This level does introduce some enemies that are slightly more difficult with the bulls, but they are basically just more aggressive rams from Stone Hill. Once you reach the end of the level, it does give you a little taste of a hidden area above you. It ends up being not too difficult to figure out. One well-timed glide will get you onto the ledge with the egg sealer, and although realizing you can glide to it from a little platform on top of the stairs isn't inherently obvious, it is kind of the only logical choice a player can make to fly to the area, and once solved, the level is complete. But this level stands as a great stepping stone for culminating multiple concepts into one level. We aren't quite done with the artisan world yet though, and I have been dodging around one of my biggest gripes with this area. Remember the dragon said we were so excited to open up? Well, let's take a look at what disappointment is like with our first boss level, Toasty. Before I get into the nitty gritty of our first boss level, I want to state that this level is a reflection of a major issue I have with the boss levels as a whole throughout the entire game. The bosses aren't even bosses. The game almost in no way makes us feel any different from your average level outside of the artisan world putting inside of a dragon's head which inherently makes this level feel more important than the rest. But honestly, later levels ditch this entirely and bosses use normal portals and half the time you only realize after seeing an enemy you haven't encountered before they might be in a boss level. Tosi takes this a bit further by making the boss battle itself a complete mockery but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm going to talk about all the boss levels here in one lump since they all relate to each other. So starting with Toasty, one thing I do actually enjoy about this level is the difficulty spike of the enemies. Honestly, these dogs that take two hits are some of the hardest in the game, no joke, but it quickly turns sour once you reach the actual boss and just see this pumpkin head standing there with a scythe and a dog, no health bar. No real introduction outside of a dragon warning you about him, he's just standing there like any normal enemy and honestly, he's just as easy as any normal enemy too. The most difficult part is killing the dogs around him as you progress further into this quote unquote boss fight. Realize he's just some sheep on stilts? Was this even a boss battle or a joke? As a kid, I was extremely confused. They hype this guy up with a huge dragon head introducing his level, the dragon warning you about how tough he can be right outside of his battle area, and literally level with tons of the most difficult enemies in the game just to have the actual boss basically be a phony. 
I figured that a real boss was going to come later, but nope, that was actually the boss. Trust me when I say the bosses don't get much better from here. Moving on to Dr. Shemp, he's actually a pretty good boss level. In the context of what else this game is offering, that is. I've already talked about the issues that exist with literally every one of these boss battles already, so let's talk about why this one stands out. Once again, we have the ass-slapping spoon ladies, but this time it gets even funnier, because if you just dodge the guys running at you, they will literally send themselves off a cliff. It's pretty hilarious. Dr. Shimp himself is actually also kind of set up as a proper boss battle, with a dragon giving you a hint at defeating him, and him also having multiple stages he jumps to that you need to defeat him on. He's probably the most entertaining boss since he kind of taunts you in between moves, although that isn't really saying much. That's all I really got to say about Dr. Shemp, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to Metalhead, who, in my opinion, is probably the best boss battle in the game. He actually feels like a boss when you battle him because he has an objective to beating him. All the other bosses get taken down in the same way as any other average enemy in the game. Even if it's as easy as destroying the pillars when they aren't electrified, it's at least a much welcome change of pace, and something different than just walking up and flaming after obstacles or during an opening. The enemies are a lot harder too, with the small monkeys getting thrown at you and being fully suited in armor. The level itself is also a lot of fun to explore, with one of the most well hidden areas in a level. The area is very easy to miss on your first run through, so it rewards the player for moving the camera around and exploring. The level almost knows you're going to defeat the boss and immediately backtrack to finish collecting, because on your way out of the boss area, it opens up to show all these hidden pathways to gems you would have completely missed while battling the boss. This is always a level I really enjoy going back to and it makes you wish the other boss levels were done this way. Alright, we got done with some good ones, now it's time to address the elephant in the room. Blowhard. This boss is quite literally the biggest joke in the entire game. Let's see how younger me feels about it. And now we're moving on to Blowhard. <clears throat> and we should be getting done with this world. In this <clears throat> Yep, feeling about the same. This boss is so easy, basic enemies are more of a challenge to get through than him. The level is extremely linear, so all you have to do is clear the enemies and follow the basic path as you chase him down to collect all the gems by the end. No hidden secrets anywhere to be found. The actual design of Blowhard himself seems like an afterthought. Almost as if the developers were like, shit, we forgot to put a boss in the Master Crafters world. Um, let's just put a beard dude in a tornado. Like, what? I'm not even sure what else needs to be said, but you can honestly finish the boss and collect all the gems in about 2 minutes, with no challenge whatsoever. By far the worst level in the game. Period. Jack Quis, uh, Jack Quest, Jack Quis, Jack Quos. The, the last boss before Nork. <laughs> and he's as simple as ever. You just fly over and flame him, kind of like the other two bosses before him. At least his level is a bit more interesting. We have some really interesting and new enemy designs that only show up in this level, which is kind of a shame. But god damn, is some of the gliding total bullshit in this level. I'm gonna go ahead and run a montage of all the times I seemingly have a perfectly fine glide but miss by a literal pixel and fall to my death. This happens literally every time I come back to this level, every glide needs to be pixel perfect and it's absolutely infuriating. His only saving grace is that, well, I mean, at least he's not blowhard. The way these bosses are handled really puts a tarnish on the game for me as a whole. In my eyes, you either go all out with the boss battles, or they should have been done away with completely. I know what you're thinking. Where's Nasty Nork? <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I'll get to him at the end. Alright, let's finally move on to our next hub world, Peacekeepers. This is where some of the problems I have with the hub worlds comes into play. I think enemies that can actually damage you in a hub world are annoying, especially how it's done in Spiral the Dragon. I'm a completionist when it comes to collectathon platformers, I just like to 100% whatever world I'm on right when I get to it. The issue with this being that you have to kill all the enemies in the original spiral to collect all the gems. This seems like a non-issue at first glance, until you realize the enemies respawn every time you leave a level. Peacekeepers is probably the least annoying level to do this since the enemies are extremely weak and they don't majorly inhibit you on your path to the next level. 
Plus, I mean, watching them hide in a tent and burning away their cover to reveal them shaking their ass at you seconds before being perished is just one of the most hilarious things you can do in a Spyro game. Unfortunately, this is the most entertaining instance of these enemies in the hub world, and continuing on, things get much more annoying. I think my favorite part of the hub is how they immediately show you a little hidden area off to your right at the beginning of the level, and it's kind of fun to figure out how to get over there because you get to actually take control of their cannons and fire them. Outside of that, it's pretty unremarkable. I've talked about almost all the levels in this hub already, but I still have one more level I want to bring up, and it is not for a good reason. Ice Cavern this level really doesn't feel like it belongs here since the entire hub and its levels have more of a desert theme to it. I do understand that sometimes just doing the same theme for every level in the world can get a little stale at times, but honestly, if you don't include the hub world, we really only have 4 levels to explore, so the theme really doesn't get too stale for me. I think they designed this level early in development, and as they got further along, they realized none of the hub worlds could really match its theme, so instead of trashing it, they just tossed it into Peacekeepers. Which I mean, is fine to a certain extent. More Spyro is always great, but the fact this level is juxtaposed with the hub isn't its only issue. This is the most boring and straightforward level in the entire game up to this point. It is basically one linear path to the end with a quote unquote hidden area right after reaching the return home portal with a little additional content. I put quotes around that because it isn't really a challenge to get to this area or to find it. The most interesting thing the level does is put a key off on a platform in the middle of nowhere. You can basically glide to it at any time from most places making it not much of a secret and all it does is force you to backtrack to the chest from earlier on in the level. Obviously I'm bashing this level pretty hard but honestly it's not like the level is a chore to complete or anything but it's just so easy and linear I never really look forward to just basically sprinting through the level. I really wanted to point out Ice Cavern in particular because this is going to be the starting point where in my opinion some of the level designs start to slip. I'll wait to talk about the rest of my least favorite levels for when I get to Dreamweavers because that deserves its own section. Moving on to Magic Crafters, the enemy annoyance goes up another small amount in the hub world, mainly because now they can alter the terrain and make it so you can't walk around freely before killing them, but for the most part that's not a bother. The worst of these two lightning enemies that puppy guard the balloonist. They aren't too difficult to dispatch, but it's just irritating having them right outside the balloonist area when I'm trying to just go to him and travel. Nothing egregious yet, but we will get there. The main positive I have for this sub is the theme. It's probably my favorite one in the game. The music is lighthearted and everything is colorful with the wizards moving the terrain around actually being pretty fun. Outside of that, it's a lot of the same stuff we've already seen. This time I'll start with the bad level because the best level and worst level of this area kind of coincide with each other. Eye Caves This is probably going to be a bit controversial because in many ways this level is a lot of fun. It's a great introduction to using the supercharge, teaching you how to jump and fly off to far places. We also have a unique enemy that is exclusive to this level, being the seal spiders which is pretty cool but that's where the level starts to fall flat. Outside of the spiders being kind of surprising the first time you see them, they're actually really easy to take care of, and also it can be very confusing first time around. Right now I'm showing you some footage of what I tried doing the first time I 100% completed this level, because for whatever reason the fairy at the top of the cave is really fidgety when giving you the fire boost power up, so I thought I had to supercharge all the way around the level and get into the top to kill the spiders since you can't just supercharge up the stairs. Once I figured out the truth I realized I wasted about 30 minutes of my life doing something completely unintended. I will never do that again, even though the feat was pretty impressive, but honestly the fairy at the top just looked like another checkpoint fairy to me. Maybe I just have a grudge with this level all these years later, but to me it's just so short and weak compared to the others. The charge gliding is simple and even if you end up screwing up they have fairies to save you and bring you right back to the charging platform. There are really no secrets to discover in this level either. Overall the level does too much hand holding and feels more like a tutorial level to get you used to supercharging than a real level. But let's look at a level that does the supercharge gliding justice. Wizard Peak is one of my favorite levels in the game. It's got some really cool hidden areas that you can get to by finding a little back entrance at the beginning of the level. The enemies are actually pretty difficult to clear out, 
The enemies with the clubs are super quick this time around, and when paired with the lightning wizards, it starts to become an actual challenge. This level is also a much better example of practicing the supercharged glide mechanic compared to hide caves. Right at the beginning of the level, you can see a huge platform with gems off to the distance, and as you progress through the level, it's always looming, begging for you to fly over and grab everything. Using the double supercharge to make your way over is a ton of fun and feels like a real accomplishment since the handholding of the previous level is gone. Just an overall challenging level that tests your skills and encourages exploration in the most fun way. To continue on with the subject of levels using the supercharge in this game, I thought I would take the time to talk about the level that takes this ability and makes use of it to its fullest potential. It's the moment you've all been waiting for ladies and gents, the most infamous level in the entire game, Treetops. What is there to say about this level? I'll start with stating that conceptually, I actually really like what this level's doing. The enemies being some kind of Frankenstein monkeys and jumping from treetop to treetop using the supercharge we practiced early in the game can be a lot of fun, and it harkens back to one of my favorite parts about Spyro I talked about earlier in this review. The sense of adventure you get by finding some gems shining off into the distance as you try to figure out a way to glide over and collect the loot. But how is it in execution? Now I'm sure some of you will disagree, but I think this is actually the best level in the entire game. This level is extremely polarizing, so I'm sure me saying this surprises many of you, but I'll explain why. I already referred to that sense of exploration as you look off into the distance and see tons of collectibles on a far off treetop as your mind scrambles to figure out a way to get over there. It feels so rewarding once you figure it out and it really tests your supercharger skills you've been building off of from earlier on in the game. But I do have a confession. To this day, I still need to look up a guide on how to jump over to the far off platforms. I know, I know, I basically just invalidated everything I've said about the level up to this point. I think that's why so many people have a dislike for this level. Figuring out how to jump over to the other treetops is honestly a bit too cryptic. That's what holds this level back the most. But then why am I still saying this level is the best in the game? Well, I actually figured it out on my own first time playing this game. I know it sounds far-fetched, but I genuinely spent hours and hours figuring it out and that feeling once I got it literally can't be matched by any of the other levels in the series. Obviously some of you will say, well, I don't want to spend hours trying to figure out such a ridiculous puzzle, but to that I would rebuttal and say you can honestly skip this level entirely or if you are going for 100%, nothing is wrong with looking up a guide to complete it. In my opinion, if you are refusing to use a guide, then stuff like this should be something you ask for out of your games. It forces you to really think and test your skills, unlike basically every other level in the series. I will admit, it's a bit of a slap in the face for a difficulty spike, but I've made my case for it, and we all have our own opinions. I completely understand why someone might dread this level. Nevertheless, let's move on to our fourth hub world, Beast Makers. This hub is probably the most boring out of the bunch, and this is where the enemies start to get pretty annoying to navigate around. You have guys who electrocute the ground that you need to wait for, and boar who are super aggressive. Not much in terms of secrets, and it's extremely small. It might even be the smallest hub in the whole game. I think Beastmakers probably has the most divisive levels in the game, but we have talked about all of those already. I think overall, this section of the game is pretty great. But we are about to dive into a barrel of shit with Dreamweavers. This hub is the worst. Honestly, it's agonizing traversing the hub world after levels, and it's mainly because of the guy up top changing people's sizes constantly and making parts impossible to get past. The enemies are actually kind of difficult, which adds to the annoyance. You have to glide around to get to a lot of places which can leave you pretty vulnerable to just falling off the stage, and they're just a bunch of mechanics that make going from level to level annoying. Also the enemy design is purposely hideous which just removes all the charm this hub could have had. Dreamweavers is seriously my least favorite part of coming back to this game, and honestly the levels here to me are just as bad. Making such bold statements, I should probably go over all the levels here and why I don't like them. I'll start with Haunted Towers, and honestly, this level is just kind of a pain in the ass. All you do is run back and forth between the fairy to keep getting a power up to clear the enemies, and collect gems. It's tedious. Obviously it's not as bad as it could be, but I really never look forward to coming back to this level because of that fact. 
Although if you know that the fairy in the hidden area of the world gives you a permanent buff, then you play through this level much differently and it gets a lot less tedious. But if it's your first time through or you don't remember, then this level is just a hassle to complete. Next up, Lofty Castle. Really, this level isn't terrible, but it just feels so uninspired. You free some fairies from crates and they unlock more of the level. Not really any big secrets to find here either, and the enemies here pose almost no threat at all. This level is always super boring to come back to. Maybe if we had some sort of cutscene or context as to why the fairies are being held captive, it would give me some motivation in wanting to free them, but they honestly just feel like gatekeepers holding you back from progressing through the level quicker. Not as bad as Haunted Towers in my opinion, but not a whole lot better either. I've already talked about the one saving grace level in this area, but it really doesn't make up for the fact that I honestly dread getting back to this area on subsequent playthroughs. I think what it boils down to is all the worlds in this area just use gimmicks to make the levels seem a little bit more interesting. And one of the gimmicks ends up being a real home run, but then the other two gimmicks end up making the levels not as interesting and just more tedious to get through. Well, we're on the home stretch, so let's talk about the last few levels and the final fight with Nasty Nork. Nork Cove is a fun level, it once again kind of falls flat from its linearity, but it seems like some of these later levels are getting rid of the free roaming aspect to add some challenge to the levels. I don't mind that, but it would be nice to have some secrets to discover. It's a ton of fun blowing up the bad guys with barrels and creating an explosion chain, so that's something this level has going for it. Overall, pretty unremarkable, but still a very solid level. Moving on to Twilight Harbor, I really like this level. The first thing that pops out is how much more difficult these enemies are compared to previous levels. Unfortunately, in the reignited version, the bullets are removed from the guns and replaced with pink goo, but if you look past that fact, it's still a great level. It has one of my favorite hidden secrets in the game. Although it isn't that difficult to find, I like the idea of altering the terrain and creating a ramp for me to jump up to a new area. Another linear level, but at least this time with a cool secret area. Well, those are the last two levels of the game. Pretty unremarkable, but solid in their own right. One grape you could have is the last levels of the game should really be a test of your skills leading up to this point, and honestly these levels don't really do it, but that's being a little nitpicky in my opinion. Finally, we get to Nasty Nork, and let me tell you, this fight is a really big letdown. But I think we all knew that. This fight really just boils down to four separate chase sequences, which as I mentioned earlier, chasing the egg stealers was one of my least favorite things to do. There's not much else to say honestly, you basically just take out two of the thieves and then chase and flame Nasty Nork twice, and the game is over. It's a real shame, but with how poor the bosses have been leading up to this point, in hindsight, it's kind of expected. I have a theory that Insomniac genuinely didn't know how to design a boss battle at the time, so they kind of just went with what they were able to do, or maybe they had time constraints. The last comparison between the reignited version and original I'll make in this review is how sad I was to see they changed the end credit scene. In the original game, it had this awesome camera sweeping through all the levels you just completed, and it was such a fun way to reflect on how long the journey you just went on to complete this game was. But in the reignited trilogy, it's just a black screen with some artwork. I mean, the artwork is nice and all, but the original did it so much better. Also, the 100% completion bonus of this game is a ton of fun and it's super amazing. Just in case someone watching this video hasn't experienced it yet, I won't spoil it. But take the time to complete the game, I promise you won't be disappointed. Now I know you guys are probably wondering why I haven't mentioned the flight stages up to this point, but it's because I don't like them. I'm sure some people think it's a great way to break the pace of the game to go off and do something else for a while, but honestly I find collecting in Spiral so much fun, I always end up doing the flight stages last when doing a 100% run through. That's not to say there isn't some fun to be had doing the stages, I just don't really like doing things under a time limit. Also, in this game the flight stages are basically all just the same with different layouts and things to collect. Can't say I hate them or love them. They are just fine, and it's hard to go into great detail about them when my opinion isn't that great on them anyways. I can say I enjoy this game's flight stages more than Spyro 2's, 
but if I had to pick my favorite flight stages from the trilogy, it would be from Spiral 3. I'll be talking about that more when I get around to doing those retrospectives, so stay tuned. Alright, well, to wrap up this review, I think I'll just summarize what I believe this game's shortcomings are, as well as its strengths along with the quick top 5 best levels in the game in my opinion. What this particular game does great is create this want for exploration out of me. The times this game is at its best in my opinion is when the levels are wide and open and the player is able to look out and search for sparkling gems off in the distance. It's got some great secret areas too, rewarding players searching every nook and cranny. The enemy design in this game in particular can be a little shoddy. Sometimes you hit some home runs to create some great looking unique enemies, and then sometimes you get Swamp Rabbit which just looks awful. The music composition is fantastic, and honestly is my favorite soundtrack out of the trilogy to just listen to outside of the game. I feel that Stuart Copeland got a little softer in the later entries if that makes sense. But as high as the highs really are in this game, the lows are pretty low. The highest far outweigh even the worst lows this game has. Not having proper bosses really sucks, and a lot of the time the boss level itself is boring and uninspired. Honestly, almost a waste of time, but it seems the further you get into the game, the more linear the levels became, losing some of the open-ended magic that made the early levels so fun to explore. The first game just seems like at times it has an identity crisis on whether it wants to make the level exploratory and fun, or linear and challenging. Both are fine, but would have been nice to find some middle ground, which in my opinion they never managed to accomplish in the trilogy. This game is definitely the most unique out of the three because of that aspect, and I think it sometimes makes me wonder how this game would have turned out if Insomniac had a little more experience under their belt before this game was created. It could have been the best Spyro ever. So for my top 5 levels it goes as follows. Treetops, Dark Passage, Wizard Peak, Dark Hollow, and Clifftown. I know it seems strange that I picked one level from each hub world, but honestly it seems like they intentionally made sure that each hub world had at least one amazing level in it that they put a lot of time into. I also think after sitting through this exhausting review, you probably understand why I believe these 5 levels are the best in the game, whether it's the theme, music, exploration, or challenge, each one of these levels excels at one of, if not more of these aspects, better than any of the other levels in the game. Let me know what your opinion is on your favorite level, and if you'd like, in the comments below, you could explain and I'd love to hear it. With that, this has been Legit Camel, signing off, until next time, when we cover Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage. Alright, I'm gonna go a bit unscripted and off the cuff here. I'll probably edit this down while I uh, while I'm like editing the video. But I just wanna give a huge thank you to anybody that actually sat and watched my retrospective in its entirety. It really means a lot to me. I probably spent like 30 or 40 hours on it, and I know like anybody that does YouTube, it's pretty standard to spend a lot of time working on videos like this, but this is honestly the first like massive project I've ever worked on for my channel. A lot of times what I used to do is I would just like record gameplay footage and I'd maybe do like a let's play out of it, or I would just kind of upload the footage raw onto YouTube without a whole lot of thought or effort put into it and honestly I got so much inspiration from watching another youtuber and I'm gonna link his channel below because I think that these videos are probably his idea or at least like if it's not he's the only one on YouTube like currently doing it still anymore but his name is King K and he does a lot of retrospective videos and the first one I watched from him was the Ocarina of Time one, and it just inspired me to do videos like this because I just don't think there's enough content on YouTube that goes into like really in-depth like reviews for the modern day on some older games. I, I like his Ocarina of Time one was really good in particular because people were so divisive on it uh, in more recent years because you know, it does have some shortcomings that I think for a long time people just chose to ignore and a lot of like nostalgia 
goes into people's heads when they think about the game and they just consider it perfect. And I think it is important that, because people were swaying like one way or the other on whether it was like an excellent game or a bad game. And I don't think either one of those like is necessarily true. Like sometimes you just fall in the middle and there's a lot of games uh, with trilogies or series like that where people remember a certain game really fondly and you know they think it's like perfect but then in reality it's not but then you also have these like bandwagon haters where they just think that the game is completely garbage and that's also not true so I think like going in depth on these games and really like breaking down every little aspect of it on like you know what makes it good and nostalgic and like you know the shortcomings that it does have being an early you know in particular with Spyro being an early platformer game um, without any like real defined characteristics yet um, it's really important to just talk about like what went right and wrong when they were doing that kind of stuff I know that kind of seems like a big rant but I really just wanted to shout out King K and just you know say that this retrospective idea isn't necessarily my own I'm kind of stealing it from somebody else and these videos you know take a lot of time to make you know like I said I think I spent 40 hours doing this one but I'm sure King K probably also spends about that much time so I mean it's kind of unrealistic to expect one youtuber to be able to cover like all these games that you know deserve to be covered in this aspect um, so I just thought I'd take up the mantle and start doing um, some PlayStation 1 games that I really had a lot of nostalgia with like Spiral the Dragon and I'll probably be doing um, a lot of other series in the future too so, you know, please comment, rate, subscribe. Like I said, sorry about ranting at the end here, but um, I really appreciate you sitting around to the end. And I hope to see you in another video.